And uh, when I got my uh, Apple Prize, you know, uh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any ideas. It completely uh, wasn't expected, of course, my age. And, uh, actually, I haven't been doing much math lately. And uh, so, and, but, but and the third interview I had or something said, well, what are you going to do with the money? And that set me back. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do with the money? <laughs> and so then I had this wonderful, I'll do something that I really thought was important. And I contacted, immediately contacted my friend Rhonda, who I've known for years, and Rhonda and Sylvia uh, Spellman. Uh, to, uh, sorry, Sylvia Bozeman uh, had uh, started a program for women, and uh, I think a large portion of the Black women PhDs in mathematics are due to, that, to this program. And so I contacted them and said, what I, should I do? And so they told me, and it's <laughs> my real pleasure to, I, you know, ordinarily one gives something uh, and uh, once one starts uh, a fund, uh, I did not, I wanted to see the effects right now. So we're, <laughs> I didn't want to put it in the bank and take the interest and leave it on for posterity. I wanted to see you people now. <laughs> and so I was, uh, I, I was delighted to, uh, to, to see, uh, and I want I want you and me to know more about what, we, uh, it's been going on uh, with your uh, program and what your ideas are about things. I should also sort of boast that I am not alone. Um, I've met Jocelyn Bell, uh, Bell Berset uh, when we both got an honorary degree from Harvard. Uh, she was the uh, astronomer that discovered quasars at a, at a uh, as a graduate student and was left off the Nobel Prize. So, <laughs> so she got a breakthrough prize, which she immediately donated to the Physics Society for the benefit of a representative minority. So I'd like to boast that not only do I believe in my project, but I have company. <laughs> anyway, okay, I'm looking very forward to, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Awesome. awesome. My name is Dorothy Wilson. I'm a professor at Morehouse College. I also have a um, director position at ICERM, um, a sister institute at Brown University. And I'm thrilled to be here. Karen's remarks is a reminder to me that the problem of underrepresentation still persists. Um, I agree she is not alone at all, um, but the impact that people with, um, that anyone, but in particular, people with such a high profile can have um, is amazing. And so I was just reminded of that. And so um, I think part of what we're gonna demonstrate today in the then and now, so we're gonna continue with the theme is that there is no single solution and, um, we need sort of more people participating in solving that problem. So we are incredibly appreciative um, to Karen um, for giving us the opportunity to spend her money, um, no. <laughs> but to um, continue to have, um, just chip away at the problem. And so I'm just going to start with some opening comments. Um, we have three panelists here that I'll introduce briefly, but they're mainly going to talk about themselves and their uh, participation in the mathematics community and how it relates to the edge community. So, um, but I just want to start briefly by saying, okay, so in 1994, Karen, along with us, I know she wasn't alone. But, you know, sort of recognize that there was a need to build a community to address some underrepresentation with women. And, um, you know, one, two key things that they wanted to do is provide a space for, you know, an exciting intellectual atmosphere and um, also a space where they could share war stories and articulate hopes and fears. And stuff. And so I think those um, dual um, opportunities is important because 
mathematics um, is a rigorous and exciting endeavor. And I think it people flourish in it when they can bring their whole selves to it and stuff. And that includes hopes and fears and war stories and, um, um, you know, everything in between. Wanda and Sylvia, similarly, a few years later, um, recognized an opportunity because again, there's not a one shop all, there's not one fix for all of these things to provide a community and a space and an exciting atmosphere for women that are entering graduate programs with a particular eye on making sure they're including underrepresented minority women. And so, you know, there was the then with two of, you know, several programs, but, you know, both Karen, Rhonda, and Sylvia continue to pay attention, continue to identify other ways to address um, underrepresentation. Edge has grown in so many ways and um, targets early career women and, um, you know, uh, even mid-career women. And so we have women in all kinds of interesting spaces now. And so one of that, that will be highlighted here. Um, these three women uh, represent really diverse spaces to engage in mathematics. And so I'm excited that they agreed to um, join us here today. Um, so, and I'll just end by saying with the now, is this collaboration with the Edge, um, Karen Edge Fellows and stuff. So we're really excited about that. We just heard a talk from Bobby Wilson, who was in the folk first cohort of Ed, um, Karen Edge Fellows. Um, it's not Karen, um, Edge Karen, it's Karen Edge. No, I know she doesn't care, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we're really excited about, you know, addressing a new gap and opportunity to try to chip away at this um, exposure problem because it's creating spaces. It's also um, creating access to spaces and access to information. Okay, so I'm gonna start with our first panelist is to my far, far left here in person um, is Laurel Ohm. And she's participated in the EDGE summer session in 2013. She's our most recent participant. And she's currently an NSF postdoc at Princeton. So I was, I, I was gonna attempt to point in the right direction. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Yes, an NSF postdoc at Princeton right now. And then next we have Omira Otega, who is a 2001 EDGE participant. And she, everybody does lots of things. I'm just highlighting one thing because I, I, I want them to talk more than me. And she's president of the National Association of Mathematicians, right, currently. And we know this is an important organization in particular for African-American mathematicians. And then here on the screen, we have Susan Diagostino. And she is a 1998 EDGE participant and actually the first EDGE PhD. So we're very proud of that. And she's in a really interesting space because she's a science writer and she's currently sort of the technology writer for insider, inside higher education. And, and so we welcome the panelists. Let's welcome the panelists. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Erica. Happy birthday, Karen. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I just want to start by talking a little bit about what EDGE has meant to me over, over my career so far, but maybe uh, I'll start with um, a bit of a story. So I happened to be spending spring 2013 or 2019 um, in Norway and uh, got to attend the Abel Prize ceremony where uh, Karen got her award, um, and it was uh, at the at the press conference afterward, I think, where um, Karen, I think, first made the first public announcement that you were um, donating this all this money to Edge, um, and so, but I think 
I might have been maybe one of the only people in that audience who <laughs> actually knew what Edge was. And so, um, but, you know, I was very excited, you know, <laughs> telling my colleagues like, oh, that's my program. It's very, very exciting. Um, so just, I want to say that, you know, it was really, really, it really felt good to, to, to have such an important program be supported in such a prominent way. Um, that really meant a lot because I think this program has meant a lot to so many people. Um, so, uh, I mean, so success in mathematics is, is really, uh, really comes down to feeling like you belong in the math community. I think that is a really key component of, of, of success, however you want to define it. And, um, I think this, so the sense of belonging can be very difficult, especially if you come from an underrepresented group. And part of what makes EDGE so special is that we have this intentional community um, that's, I mean, once you become a part of the EDGE community, you, the support is always there. Um, and so for me, I participated in the EDGE summer program um, in 2013. So that's a, an intensive four week um, program where essentially the goal is to just throw you off the deep end mathematically um, um, so that you kind of experience sort of the shock of maybe feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, but the sort of the beauty of it is that um, you're with, you know, adults, a dozen other women in the exact same boat. Um, and so you can kind of navigate that all together. Um, and so you have this shared experience that creates a really tight bond and you can sort of fall back on that going forward and entering graduate school. And so that, you know, the sort of the hurdles that you encounter in graduate school don't seem quite so scary. Um, and so, um, I mean, so the summer program was my introduction to EDGE, um, but I love that EDGE is being expanded now. I mean, there are always been sort of other ways to become a part of the EDGE community, but especially now um, with like the Karen uh, EDGE Fellowship Program, there are, um, there are multiple ways to, to get involved in EDGE um, later on or to just be integrated into this, uh, this EDGE community um, because really it's, it's that community aspect that has really meant so much to me over, over the course of my career so far. Um, and so uh, I also want to kind of emphasize that I think it's really important that EDGE is, is um, very diverse, um, both racially and mathematically. And I mean that, so I mean, the emphasis of EDGE is, is really on, on people from underrepresented groups. Um, but I think it's important that, that um, you know, that sort of everyone, anyone can be a part of EDGE because it allows us to, to meet people that we wouldn't have necessarily met otherwise and to really get to know um, people that we wouldn't have gotten to know probably in, in other settings. Um, so, I mean, so I've certainly been um, as an early career participant or, you know, as a relatively early career person, I've, I've met a lot of uh, mentors and role models that I wouldn't have necessarily met otherwise. So a lot of connections that I wouldn't have made otherwise. And hopefully um, that's something that I can pay forward as, as, a, as a member of the EDGE community um, to be sort of uh, a mentor to, to you know, a really diverse group of people as well going forward. Um, and then so, and then, you know, these sort of mentor mentee relationships have been really important for me as a an early career mathematician, but it's also it's also um, it's also the sort of the peer connections um, that have been really really important for me. Um, so in connecting with other early career mathematicians through the Edge program. Um, so uh, one thing is so I help organize a, a session every year at the at the joint math meetings um, for for people connected with Edge to come and present talks on whatever they want to talk about. So research talks um, can be, you know, it can be about other things as well, um, but just have a venue for people to come, people from EDGE to come together and, and you know, reconnect with each other, do additional networking, meet other, other edgers. And um, I think through these connections, I think a lot of 
uh, a lot of really nice things have happened. Um, so one example is that uh, at the past joint math meetings at the edge at the edge session, I I met with uh, or I heard a talk from from Sarah who is in the audience right now, um, and I thought, oh, that's an that was an interesting talk. I would like to learn more about that, and so I you know was able to connect with her and you know invite invite her out to give a talk at at the university this week and then you know, now she's here also attending the, the conference too um but it's uh it's those types of connections um you know that you feel really comfortable making because we're all sort of under this same umbrella of the edge community um and so it's kind of a um a way to approach people that that uh you know I maybe wouldn't have wouldn't have been totally comfortable approaching otherwise um and so i think that those that the it's really those connections within the edge community that have really been important for me so far thank you Mark. okay so we're each taking turns i also have notes um i I just want to apologize at the beginning. I flew on a red eye last night. So that's why I have notes to keep me on task. <laughs> I know, I but my name is Almeida Ortega. I'm an associate professor of mathematics and statistics at Sonoma State University in California. It's part of the California State System. I'm also the president of the National Association of Mathematicians, like Rebecca mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I've so thankful for both of these roles and I'm so thankful for EDGE. I think that um, the EDGE program has been instrumental in me persisting in mathematics as well as pursuing the things that I have pursued. Um, so let me just back up to how I even got into EDGE. And also I want to back up even further because someone did ask me this during the break, what does EDGE stand for? <laughs> Enriching diversity in graduate education, the EDGE program for women. And um, I think EDGE does a great job of enriching the mathematics community. Um, for myself, I went to a predominantly white institution. I went to Pomona College for my undergrad. I was a math and music double major. And I will say in my math cohort, I was the only woman and the only person of color. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that I felt alone, but I was just like, I'm weird. It was just sort of like, I'm the oddball. And, and I had, I just accepted that. And so when I joined EDGE, at the suggestion of my thesis advisor, Amy Radinskaya, who had been teaching the analysis workshop in EDGE, um, I suddenly realized, I was like, wait, 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 <laughs> I'm not the oddball. It's just, Pomona is a very unique place with a unique demographic distribution that doesn't reflect me in particular, but EDGE did. And so I met women in EDGE that are my lifelong friends. Um, my very best friend, Emile Davy Lawrence, was in, she's in the second cohort of Ullenbeck Fellows. Sorry, Karen Edge Fellows. Um, and I love her. I love the people that I've met in this. I'm her, I'm the godmother of her children. She's my very best friend. I'm also going to say my hands are like borderline arthritic right now because my girlfriend, Carla Cartwright Williams, who was also in the EDGE program in 2001 with me, she just had a baby. So I'm not knitting fast enough. <laughs> but it came out already. But these are people that are going to be my friends for life. And that's just in my cohort. Um, we talk about the summer program. And the summer program was invaluable for me also to get a head start on the classes that I was going to take in grad school. Um, I'm fantastic at mathematics, but I'm slow at it. <laughs> so I needed that extra time to go through the material. And I went to the University of Iowa where they're, they're, they put you where you need to be. If you need to go back to undergrad and, and do that level of math analysis and that level of algebra, then that's where you go. At master's level, PhD level. And I was able to go to the PhD level because of my experience um, in EDGE. I believe that that's, that preparation set me up for success in grad school. And I will also say, aside from being set up for success, EDGE provided me with that network that sustained me. And so Lurga was talking about how, you know, I forgot the exact words that you used, but essentially you could share a war stories. That was it. We were able to come back together and share war stories. So at the joint math meetings, we, I remember my cohort, we all shared a hotel room and went to, that was my first joint math meetings. And so it was just really wonderful to 
go through the rigors of that first semester. I don't know if any you guys remember your first semester in grad school. It's rough. And so to be able to go back to this essentially home, it's like a mathematical home, a mathematical sisterhood, and cry about it. Or, you know, compliment each other on our achievements. You know, so we could just share in that experience in a way that I couldn't necessarily with the people who were in my cohort at Iowa in my first year. I mean, I, they're my friends as well, but I felt like we had a different connection. And also you talked about sort of like going through that intense experience galvanizes you. And so Edge has been instrumental to me, not only that cohort, but also like I'm saying, every joint math meetings, there's sort of a mini reunion, we have a dinner together and I meet people from all of the cohorts. I, I'm trying, I feel like I met you first at, at one of the dinners and then whenever we, we just hung out at the AWM Research Symposium, had a lovely time sharing a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> and, and so um, it's a family, Edge becomes a family. Um, I will also say my summer experience um, in Edge in 2001, it, that year it was hosted at Spelman College and I had never been to an HBCU before. <laughs> I'm the president of NAM right now. And I had never been, I've never even, I didn't know what that acronym meant before I went to EDGE. So that experience was galvanizing for me. I mean, I watched the Cosby show, but I, I was like, this is a fictional family. So this is a fictional university or type of university. And I will say also my parents are immigrants from Panama. So I, they're not American born. So I don't have that, that history necessarily that comes down from my parents. We also talked about first generation students, like what is that information that you're getting from your parents? My parents can tell me about like Panamanian history, but not so much US history. And so it was really beautiful for me to realize that there were these institutions, historically black colleges and universities that existed in the United States. And so I thank Edge for teaching me that. Um, let's see, back to my notes. <laughs> Um, so I think that, um, as I understand it, so I will also say I, I did go back to EDGE and um, engage with EDGE later as the, as one of the analysis workshop facilitators, which was also really wonderful to do. Um, at that year, it was hosted at Pomona College, my undergraduate institution, so it was nice to go back and teach there, <clears throat> to go back to Pomona, but also to go back to EDGE. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, um, I think in going back, I also realized all these different opportunities, like Laurel mentioned, different ways that you can engage with EDGE as you continue in your career. And I was just thinking about how, I don't know the exact timing because I was not engaged in this. This was the directors and you could probably say, speak to this better. But when the NSF stopped funding EDGE and stopped funding like the Carleton program as well, I think summer mathematics program for women at Carleton, that was ridiculous. That was crazy to me. And I remember year after year, just having to, Edge having to scramble for funding and try to find funders. I remember actually uh, a chunk of that time also being a visiting professor so outside of Edge at Pomona College when um, Amy Radiskaya was one of the co-directors and was trying to get funding from Google, trying to get funding from Microsoft and just seeing the amount of effort that went into that. It, made me very sad, but it also helps me to understand how important it is, this, this enormous donation that Dr. Ullenbeck gave to EDGE. And so I, you also talked about how high profile that donation is. I think that is so important because you sort of are putting other people on notice. Like, what are you doing for math? What are you doing to increase diversity? So thank you so much for doing that, for taking your position and using it to make change in the mathematics community. Thank you. Thank you. you have the power. <laughs> but, um, yeah. and this fellowship is fantastic. Like I said, there's, there's, it's been mentioned, there's been three iterations of this six Bloomberg fellows. And um, that is, is really so wonderful. But I just think it's really wonderful to see how you, your work has not only influenced the discipline of mathematics, but also the culture of mathematics. And I just met you for the first time today, but just also listening to your friends talk about you, I can see like what a wonderful human being you are and what a wonderful mathematician. And I'm gonna be honest, that combination isn't always the case. So I'm so honored <laughs> to help you celebrate your 80th birthday. You're part of this.
Um, Hi. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, we're ready for you. Okay, perfect. Hi, I'm Susan D'Agostino. Um, I was in the first EDGE class um, in 1998. And at the time, for all I knew, that was going to be the first and last class, I don't, I, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> None of us knew. We were very small at the time. Um, you know, Rhonda Hughes, Sylvia Bozeman, Amy Radinskaya. Um, you know, we had many visitors from the math community. Um, we were, you know, I look back now and I think, wow, they really <laughs> assembled a lot of incredible people to come and visit with us, Fern Hunt, uh, many others. Um, and what I can say is that. Um, Edge has, I've grown up with Edge. I've, I've come of age professionally um, alongside Edge and it's really been phenomenal to watch the community to turn into, you know, this very grassroots small effort um, to something that, um, to what it is today, which is really this, this force within the math community. Um, so I'll share that um, I'm, my path has been somewhat non-traditional um, and um, I always had two dreams. One was to become a mathematician and the other was to become a writer. And um, when I arrived at Dartmouth uh, College, which is where I worked on my PhD, um, by the end of the first year, I was the only woman left um, in my cohort, in my class. And um, I definitely felt <laughs> that having edge behind me um, made me, uh, manage the challenge of that situation with much more awareness, um, skill, and um, support, frankly, that I needed. Um, and so when I, um, uh, you, know, dur you know, for many women, uh, myself included, graduate school years can overlap reproductive years. And um, so not only was I the only woman, but I was the only pregnant woman. <laughs> um, and, you know, at the time, getting any sort of leave was not an option. Um, so, um, you know, it was definitely amazing to know that I had edge behind me. During my grad school years, um, several times I went back to edge to, you know, speak with the other students, um, get advice for myself. Um, and I was very grateful for that. Um, I, I did teach for a decade, um, you know, followed the traditional path, earned tenure, um, you know, excellence in teaching award, all of that, um, loved it, <laughs> taught my heart out, enjoyed working with my students. But I also um, kept thinking, you know, I also had this idea that I wanted to write. And um, I actually can say that my uh, exposure to EDGE gave me confidence that I could chart my own path and that I could, you know, even if it didn't look like anybody else's path that I had seen before. Um, so there was a point at which I thought, wait, if I'm ever going to do this, you know, combining math and, um, you know, and, and writing, um, I better <laughs> get, get on that, uh, that goal. And um, so I actually decided to leave academe because I decided that what I wanted was to live in the space between the math community and the science community and the public, and that I would be somebody who could translate um, what's happening. Um, so one of, um, oddly enough, Edge actually <laughs> helped me out a lot because Amy Radinskaya got in touch with me and said, hey, I know you're interested in writing and publishing. And, um, you know, we'd love to have an edge book. Um, so I ended up working on that with um, four other edgers on my, um, you know, on, on the editorial board. And you can see right there in the title, um, a celebration of the edge program's impact on the mathematics community and beyond. And that was a very uh, carefully chosen title. Um, the edge community you've heard from my co-panelists very eloquently describing how the edge community has had an incredible and powerful and positive impact on the math community. And in edge, we also talk about something called second generation edge effects. And I would say that's um, sort of the beyond part <laughs> in the book um, that it's not just only about having an impact on the math community, it's also about having an impact um, beyond the math community. 
Um, and sometimes it can be, you know, having a second generation effect where an edger does something, maybe starts another program in the math community, and that would count as second gen as well. Um, my personal definition of it is that, um, you know, we can actually go out there and, um, you know, there's a lot that's happening in the math community that the public, that would be of interest to the public if they could understand what, um, you know, what's, what is happening. Um, so for you know, several years, several years, I uh, was a freelance journalist, um, you know, working, you know, writing articles, uh, math and science articles for mainstream publications like the Atlantic and the Washington Post and Financial Times and others, um, you know, Quantum Magazine, for example. Um, and, um, and for me, I, I love living in that space between the math community and the public and being the person who translates that. Um, today I'm working at Inside Higher Ed uh, and I focus mostly on technology, but I get math and math article in there and science as well, whenever I can. Um, and for me, it's been, it's extremely gratifying. I, I feel like Edge helped me realize how to identify and say out loud, if only to, first to myself, what it was that I really wanted out of this. Um, and for me, it was always about combining math and writing and, and math and science and writing. Um, and um, somehow I found my way <laughs> and I'm really grateful for EDGE. Um, so I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Before we open it up to questions, um, Susan, would you say a little bit about your writing at the Heidelberg Foundation? Sure. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, as a, as a mathematician journalist, I actually get to, you know, I, I choose which stories are important. That's what every journalist does. Um, and I actually, my personal belief um, is that. You know, we obviously need the the world needs mathematicians doing research. Um, that goes without saying. But we also need to embed mathematicians in other parts of society, and journalism can be one of those places. Um, you know, policy, government policy, government research as well, um, or other places. There are many places where mathematicians, um, you know, can actually have an impact um, about how math is talked about and used in society. And um, as a journalist who focuses on math and science, uh, I can tell you that there are concerns about representation, inclusion, and diversity on how math and science is depicted to the public. Um, so for example, that can come in the form of what stories do we choose to tell about the math community? And if we're not paying attention, um, you know, sometimes it, the easiest stories to tell are the ones that are getting the most attention, not the ones that, um, you know, you have to go digging a little bit more for in order to ensure that we're having representation. So sometimes it can be whose research gets covered. Um, other times it can be what sources do you call? Um, you know, many uh, stories in the mainstream, mainstream press that are on math and science, um, you know, they're only quoting um, overrepresented mathematicians and scientists. Um, so um, Ulrika mentioned the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, which is I'm um, actually headed there tonight. It's a, an annual event in Germany, um, where um, it's a the, the world's largest gathering of the Abel Prize winners, the uh, Fields Medalists, and the Turing Award winners. So the laureates um, in math and computer science. Of course, I, I believe um, Dr. Ullenbach was um, at, at a recent one um, when I think during the pandemic, um, but it's back in person this year. And for example, there are journalists, I'm, I'm the one journalist who goes from the US. There are journalists from all around the world. Typically it's an invitation only event, um, but the journalists are there to broadcast news from the forum. And it is a very important high profile event. Um, that gets broadcast around the world through the journalists who attend. Um, and for example, this year, uh, there is not a single uh, woman laureate in attendance. And 
that's not a criticism of the women <laughs> at all, because there are very few of them who are even qualified to um, attend the event. Um, and I would say they more than, uh, you know, represent, they more than, uh, you know, do, they, they carry a heavier, heavier load than I would say most of the other laureates um, in speaking with journalists when there are opportunities. Um, but, um, yeah, so events like this, um, you know, and, and I, as a journalist, I, I need to cover it. It's, a, it's an important event. Um, but I also make sure that the stories that I'm telling um, and the stories that I'm writing also, um, you know, cover important <laughs> research and um, news from the math community that um, include a much wider representation of mathematicians. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for some questions. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. You know, I feel like I should talk after every talk. So. <laughs> this one is something that really bothers me, and it's not something I'm making. I'm, I'm, and that is, is that uh, I have myself felt more and more uh, confined in what I can say about um, practically everything, to be honest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the affirmative action, whether it's uh, 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 dis discrimination or about what we can do to change things, or uh, I mean, a whole lot of things that. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are it's, that I think are go, kind of going bad in the math community, but I'm afraid to talk about it because of uh, of the publicity, the, the negative publicity that comes seems to come to anybody that uh, uh, airs a frank discussion. Uh, and I, I wonder if you people actually find yourself uh, and, uh, worrying about that content. It's, 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 it seems so easy. It's more earthly, you know. It's so easy. Well, I mean, the president's name. Yeah, I certainly do. I mean, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all the time. Even when I made that comment about not knowing about HBCUs, I was like, that's going to come back to bite me later. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I was going to actually say, we, none of us know enough about it. Mm -hmm. because, uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I did meet someone from um, a, uh, HBC. Uh, I haven't got the right yeah, historically back right. knowledge on when I uh, I was on a pat I was uh, I did an interview for Heidelberg Forum and then I met and they the the Heidelberg Forum found uh, two students of color or they, I mean student students and young people of color but uh, to interview me and I was very comfortable with it, but uh, um, I I don't know I I have become less and less willing to. To talk about it. any advice you have on me, I think I know what I do. But as I immediately run to my friend, the public, the, the guy in charge of publicity, and I, yes, so I have a plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it's kind of not an uncomfortable place to be. I think we, as a society, altogether have sort of lost the ability to just have a discussion, like a civil discussion with each other. And it's really unfortunate. Um, and it's even as I'm, I'm like, what can I say? Right now? Um, I don't like cancel culture because that doesn't give you any room for healing or for becoming a better person. And so I think that's a big part of why people are afraid to speak up. Um, it's unfortunate. I think we just have to practice civil discourse and try to be that example for other others because I don't I don't know how else to fix that problem. You get off social media. <laughs> yeah right I, I I actually was off and I will never go on. <laughs> I would add um, I've noticed a difference between academe and journalism. Um, and it may be because in academe um, you know when I was in academe you know, as a professor, um, you know, my job was not necessarily to, um, you know, that I was supposed to teach, maybe do some research, um, you know, serve on committees. Um, 
you know, there were there were several items before. Um, I, I'm trying to think about how to put this. Um, it wasn't my main job, and there's so much coming at you when you are an academic um, that if you can handle like the top three or top five pieces of your job well, well then you're doing fantastic. <laughs> um, and of course, there there are hard there are difficult conversations that need to be had. Um, and there are many, many dedicated people in academe who are working on having them with um, heart and care and, um, you know, consistency. Um, I would say as a journalist, I'm finding it a little bit easier because my job right now is to tell the truth. And, um, you know, it's to report, to, to find a story, to... Um, and often I can say that I think I know what a story is going to be. I, I, I would say more often than not, when I choose a story and what I'm going to be writing, I think, okay, I know what this story is about. And then I get into the reporting and it's often about, because, you know, journalism, it's often about telling human stories, even if you're, um, you know, if at the heart is, you know, a math topic or a tech topic, um, you really want to understand how does this impact humans? Um, in the reporting, I realized, oh, the story is not exactly what, there's much more nuance here. And if I do my job well, it's about getting that nuance. Um, and yes, social media, um, thankfully I work at a place now where there's no comments section, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, under articles, um, but it, it, it is difficult. It is very difficult because we're all, we all have very challenging, demanding jobs, and this is additional work. I was sharing with Ulrika earlier, even, um, you know, m ensuring that I have diverse sources can be challenging because often the, um, you know, my recording equipment, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily pick up accents as well. And so the transcript comes back and that requires more time um, or finding a source, you um, that, um, you know, it, it takes up more time sometimes to ensure that I have diverse sources, you know, it's not just, you know, quickly go to the easiest, um, um, you know, source. So um, I think proceeding with knowledge that any extra effort we make while doing our jobs, <laughs> all of which are hard, um, any, any extra effort that we make is, um, contributes um, and hopefully all of our small efforts will add up to something. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just um, end by adding that I, I don't, it's just critically important for us to understand opposing, I'm going to use that word, viewpoints or experiences so that we can sort of bridge the gap and stuff. So somehow I, I think it is, um, I do think even when what we hear is not pleasing, I think um, to keep the conversation going as Amira was referring to and allow each of us grace, I think is important. So um, most of all, I want to um, you know thank Karen again and thank the whole audience for taking the time to listen. I know sometimes um, it's the end of the day and we're in the way of dinner. And <laughs> Um, but we really appreciate your attention and your listening ears and I'll be around all week, but no, all weekend. Um, and so I'm happy to engage in any conversations. Thank you.